All right, so oh, I'm putting Lori in charge. I'm going to hit record, after which she will announce the title of the book, the two authors, Michelle Baker, uh, and uh, the chapter t number and title, and we'll read. There you go. All right, there. This is By the Book by Lori Cole and Michelle Baker, and this is Chapter 21, Up Scat Creek. Halfway to the top of Zauberberg, Owl's vision clouded over. Clutching at his side, he collapsed to the stony ground. Every breath he took felt like a dagger plunging between his ribs. He laid his cheek down on the soft green foliage at the edge of the path, angry at himself for his own weakness. Hawk could have made this climb easily. Feeling sorry for himself was getting him nowhere, however. Moreover, a feeling of intense cold was prickling his cheek, making it uncomfortable to lie where he was on the ground. When he sat up, he saw that his cheek was wet, as though from tears. He looked down and saw that the crystalline blossoms had disappeared where his head had lain. Hmm. Owl reached out to touch one of the remaining flowers, whose transparent petals were shaped like tiny snowflakes. Remarkably, the blossom melted instantly at the warmth of his hand. How is such a thing possible? Experimentally, Owl conjured up the image of the perceived rune spell in his mind and focused on the strange flowers. As he expected, he saw a faint glow of magic emanating from the blossoms. Through practice, he had begun to appreciate the subtle differences in the type of magic. This was not the tame, structured magic that he'd sensed from Marana's piece, but instead, more like the chaotic energy he'd seen at the fairy ring. It was concentrated solely in the blossoms. However, the leaves of the plant gave no indication of magical energy at all. Owl tried unsuccessfully to pick another of the blossoms, but it melted immediately. He gazed thoughtfully at the drop of water on his fingertip and saw that, even as it melted, it still pulsed faintly with magic. How long, he wondered, would it take to collect enough of the pure water to be of use in a potion? He looked up longingly at Erasmus's tower, which seemed so far away. Then he glanced up at the sky and saw that it was well into afternoon. There wouldn't be time enough to do both, but a single day might be all the difference when it came to tracking bear. It was settled then. Erasmus would have to wait. Taking an empty jar from his rucksack, Al opened it, set, ne set it nearby on the ground, and began harvesting the magical water drop by drop. And so then I tricked the stable master into leaving, said Hawk proudly, and into giving me five mont before I cut the initials off the blanket and scrammed. Hmm. Scrammed just didn't sound right. Scrum? Scrum? Where was Al when he needed him? It was almost time for the closing of the town gates, and Al had yet to show up at the inn. You stole from the castle? breathed Wren. Wow. Really, it was nothing, Hawk said with a show of modesty. Falcon looked thoughtful. The sadness in his eyes still hadn't gone away, and Hawk was beginning to worry about him. I don't think the Baron would be upset, Falcon said at last, if we can get Bernard back by using the initials. Of course he wouldn't, said Hawk. He can always make another saddle blanket, but without the Baroness, he can't very well make another son. If Falcon had, had even heard Hawk's attempt at humor, it certainly didn't show in his face. Just then, Owl entered, looking winded, but triumphant. I have magical water, he announced, from some ice flowers that grow on the path to Zauberberg. Great, said Hawk. Now we have only one ingredient left. I want to help, Wren said. You guys get to do everything. Don't be silly, Hawk said, and gestured for Al to join them. Okay, now all that's left is something from the enchanted form. Now that must mean the bear. But I don't even know where the bear is now that we've set it free. I don't want to search the whole valley. Actually, Al said, 
I don't think it will be necessary to find the bear just yet. Why not? The bear lived in that cave for two years, Al reminded him, assuming it is truly is Barnard von Siegborg. So there must be enough scat in that cave to make a thousand dispel potions. Let me get it, said Wren. I can do that. Wren looked at, Hawk looked at Wren in amusement. She clearly had no idea what they were talking about. At her excited, hopeful expression, Hawk burst out laughing. Actually, said Al with a slight smile, I see no reason why she couldn't. If it would make her feel useful, we could accompany her as far as the cave. Falcon was the only one who still looked serious. I don't think you want to do that, Wren, he said with a reproachful look at Hawk and Owl. Why not? said Wren indignantly. I'm part of this family too, and it's my turn to be an adventurer. Yeah, Falcon, said Hawk between chuckles. Don't be such a party pooper. Al, across the table, nearly choked on his tea. Wren's baffled expression made Hawk laugh even louder. As he caught his breath, he looked up at Falcon, whose face was still somber and disapproving. Oh, I'm sorry, said Hawk to his twin, wiping tears from his eyes. Did you want to get it yourself? I know you're the scat expert in this family. Now even Al couldn't hide his amusement. Falcon ignored him. Do you know what bear scat is, Wren? He said, laying a hand on her shoulder as she sat there perplexed. Of course. Well, no. So what's so funny? Hey, Hawk protested, giving Falcon a jab in the ribs. She already said she'd do it, didn't you, Wren? You promised, didn't you? I said so, didn't I? Now what's the joke? Scat means dung. Hawk cried, howling with laughter. Wren gets to go muck the bear cave. What? Wren shrieked. That's not fair. You did agree to it, Wren, said Falcon with a sigh. Most importantly, said Owl, back to his usual dignified expression, this will be the last ingredient in the potion. We can then work on tracking the bear and disenchanting it. He turned to Wren and laid a hand over hers. Fox, he said gravely, you really will be happy helping us very much. Hawk saw Wren flush and took pity on her. Hey now, Jenny Wren, he said affectionately. Sometimes adventurers have to do things that aren't very glamorous. Believe me, I know. Yeah, great, said Wren. You guys get to do all the magical stuff, and all I get is a load of... Falcon eyed her sternly, and Wren fell silent. If it makes you any better, Fox, said Hawk carefully, using her preferred nickname, I had to shovel horse poop for an hour to get that saddle blanket initials. I kind of left that part out. Wren managed a little smile. Okay, she said. It's just not exactly my idea of being an adventurer. Well, said Hawk, you'll feel like an adventurer when the baronet is returned to his castle. Believe me. Wren's smile brightened and Hawk couldn't help but smile back. Sometimes it is kind of nice having her around, he had to admit. Hawk slept like the dead that night and woke just before the sun showed itself above the eastern mountains. After a light breakfast, he roused his comrades, feeling cheerful. This would be their first group task, and he enjoyed playing the part of the heroic leader. He prodded them through their morning meal and chewed them out the door as the town streets began to glow with the blushing light of dawn. It was a breezy morning, and the branches of fir and spruce trees hissed and whispered together above their heads. As they tramped through the forest in noisy procession, scaring off anything living for miles, Hawk had Wren quiz him on the passages from the hero manual. It wouldn't be long now, after all, before he came face to face with the baronet Barnard von Siegborg. He was already working on his introduction speech. Is it, I entreat thee, or I entreat thou? He asked Al. 
but Al had his nose in his own book, quite literally stunning as he walked. Periodically, Falcon reached over to gently steer Al out of the path of a troublesome root or, or branch. If Al noticed, he gave no sign of it. Hawk felt a thrill of pride when they at last came upon the battleground where the skeleton of the goon lay, picked clean now by the laufers. So, Wren, he said, putting his arm around her amiably, this is where Falcon and I killed the goon. And you see that cave? That is where we set the bear free and killed the kobold. One day, this cave will be the stuff of legend. Legend, said Wren, seeming distracted by the sight of the goon's enormous bones. What legend? Why, the legend of Hawk, of course, said Al dryly, putting away his book. Falcon said nothing but smiled to himself. It was the first time Hawk had seen him smile in two days. Just wait, said Hawk, drawing his sword to strike an exaggerated hero pose. You'll all be impressed when you have a hero for a brother. Then he swept his sword pointedly toward the cave. Okay, Wren, get in there. In there, Wren pointed. It's kind of dark, isn't it? It's a cave, Wren, said Hawk, sheathing his sword. Caves aren't known for their brightness. Don't worry, asked, added Falcon reassuringly. You'll be able to see once your eyes adjust. Wren still held back a little bit pale. Are you sure the kobold's dead? Hawk laughed and mussed her hair. Wren, you silly. We carried it back to the guild hall, wrapped him in Al's cloak. It was very, very dead. As is my cloak, said Al ruefully. Wren had moved closer to the cave, but still seemed reluctant to enter. It smells pretty bad in there. Good, said Hawk. You should have no trouble finding out what you're after then. Just follow your nose. Falcon came up behind Wren and put a hand on her shoulder. You don't have to do this if you don't want to, he said softly. I can go get it. Wren's spine stiffened and she shrugged off Falcon's hand. No, I can do it. Still, she just stood there staring into the darkness. Hawk glanced at the shortening shadows. Some time before we're old, Wren. Oh, fine, she said with a frustrated little exhale. I'll go into that stinky old cave and get your stinky old bear scat. What will I do with it? Hawk shrugged. Just put it in your bag and bring it out here. But then my bag will be all stinky. Hawk raked a hand through his hair in frustration. Then use mine, for heaven's sakes. You wonder why we don't give you more stuff to do. Wren took his backpack from him and scowled. I'm going, I'm going. She disappeared into the cave. While Hawk waited, he looked over at Al, who had already started to read again. This time, Al flipped right past the alphabet to stare at pages that, to Hawk, seemed completely blank. So how did it go with Erasmus, Al? Hawk said, to ease his own discomfort. He didn't like the fact that his little brother was starting to give him the creeps. Al looked up, his unfocused eyes coming to rest in the general area of Hawk's face. I'm flattered by your interest in my studies, he said after a moment's hesitation. I just want to know what Erasmus is like. Is he really old and scary? Al's weight shifted ever so slightly. As it turns out, Al said, I once again got sidetracked. You mean you chickened out again? Al drew himself up to his full five feet, three inches. When was that kid ever going to grow? And glared icily in the direction of Hawk's left ear. Fear has nothing to do with it, he said. In this particular case, I had to choose between getting in to see Erasmus and helping you with your blasted potion, so I'd appreciate a little respect. Respect from your older brother, said Hawk with a grin. Boy, are you barking up the wrong tree. Before Owl could frame an answer, Wren suddenly came tearing out of the cave as though her trousers were on fire. Bear, bear, run for it. What? Hawk stood for a moment in confusion and then saw the bear lumbering out of the cave after Wren. 
Hawk's sword seemed to leap into his hand of its own accord. Falcon, help! Hawk shouted, but Falcon just stood there, apparently frozen in terror. No! cried Owl. Wren came running right past Hawk, and Hawk moved to Falcon's side, sword up at the ready. The bear reared up, and Hawk saw Falcon thrust his shield in the way of its claws. The bear knocked Falcon to the ground, roaring. Then it turned towards Hawk, ready to swing one of its enormous paws at Hawk's mis midsection. Hawk felt a calm certainty flow through him. A crooked strike would be the perfect thing to embed the end of his sword right into the bear's paw, using that force of the bear's attack to land a crippling blow. He held his sword ready. Suddenly, the bear dropped to all fours right in front of Hawk. He raised his sword for a lethal parting shot strike without even thinking. Hawk, stop! shouted Falcon, stepping in way of the blade before Hawk could swing. I'll calm the bear! Hawk stopped. He realized that he had really been about to skewer, and he felt a splash of shame. An excited voice came from high above them. Is it safe now? It was Wren, who had apparently clambered up the nearest tree like a frightened cat. I think so, said Falcon, still staring at the bear. What are you going to do, you idiot? snapped Owl in a rare display of temper. Bring the Baron his son's head on a platter? Hawk stammered, his face turning scarlet. Sorry, I, I was going to. Don't bother, Al said acidly. Wren, are you hurt? Wren was already climbing down the tree. I'm okay, she said. It didn't even get near me. As Wren walked toward the bear, Falcon drew in a sharp breath. Don't get too close. Why not, she said cockily. It's tame now, isn't it? Hawk pulled Wren away from the bear and hugged her protectively. Just don't, he ordered. Did you get any bear scat? He said. No, I thought bear hair would be better. I didn't want to mess up your bag. You tried to get hair off of it? Said Falcon in astonishment. No wonder it was angry. It was sleeping, Wren protested. I didn't think it would notice. Did you get any? Hawk asked. No, Wren said glumly, scuffing her shoe against the ground. I almost made it, but it woke up too soon. I'll get it now. Falcon looked on the verge of a fit. Wren, don't you dare! Fal Wren just frowned. It's calm now, so what's the big deal? Falcon just threw up his hands and stalked away. You're as fat as Hawk, he muttered. Hawk grinned at Wren and ruffled her hair. Well, go ahead, little adventurer, before the spell wears off. Wren, for once, seemed perfectly happy to do as she was told. As Falcon walked through the woods to the healer's place, carrying all the remaining ingredients for the dispel potion, he shook his head in disgust. Wren was starting to act just like Hawk, and Falcon didn't like it one bit. She was always one for getting in trouble, but never dangerous trouble. He worried the problem over until he got reached the gate to the healer's hut. Then he paused. He'd made a complete dolt of himself the last time he was here. The best he could hope for was that, knowing he was a dolt, Amelia would no longer have a crush on him. Falcon walked up to the open doorway and peered in. Amelia was standing on a stool in the corner of the room, untying some parsley that hung down from the ceiling to dry. Falcon cleared his throat nervously. Uh, hello? Um, good day? Are you busy? Amelia greeted him with a warm smile. I always have time for you, she said, climbing down from the stool. Falcon, right? He nodded, getting a sinking feeling in his gut as she looked at him, her eyes shining. I can tell, she said. Your brother's got a different energy about him. Like a charging bull, that one. She took her handful of parsley over to the bubbling cauldron and dropped it in, giving it a brief stir. Today, the house smelled more like barley soup than medicinal herbs. I brought the ingredients for the dispel potion, Falcon said. The, the rest of the ingredients, that is, he said seeing the glowing skull on the post over by the fireplace. 
Its dead, malevolent eyes gave him the shivers. Wonderful, said Amelia, dusting off her hands on her apron and coming over to Falcon. Well, let me see what you've got. Falcon opened his satchel and pulled out some jars gathered from the inn. The jar labeled pickles has dust from the pixies, he exclaimed, placing it on the table. The one labeled sauerkraut has magical water. And this... Falcon felt his throat close up, and he fambled, fumbled uselessly inside the bag for a moment. Then he found the fragment of the stag's horn and withdrew it, handing it directly to Amelia without a word. Falcon? The healer's voice was soft, and he couldn't meet her eyes. He heard her pull a stool over to him and seat herself, so that she was looking up into his face. Then he felt the touch of her cool hand on his arm. What happened? She asked softly, her flirtatious manner gone. The guardian is dead, he said quietly. How? Amelia sounded so stricken that Falcon, despite his efforts at control, felt tears flood his eyes. I led an ogre to the Ickenfrau's grove by accident, he said. It followed me, and, and the stag tried to protect her. It, it was injured badly. I held it while it died. Amelia's hand, still on Falcon's arm, trembled slightly. He felt a tear slip from his lashes, and he pulled back embarrassed. He brushed his hands across his eyes, then took a deep breath. Strangely, he felt a little better. You're the first person I've told that to, he said. I don't know what to say, she said, her tone as full of awe as it was of sorrow. He glanced at her, and to his dismay, he saw that her eyes, too, were bright with tears. Hurriedly, he pulled out the patch of material Hawk had given him. He set it down beside the jars. Those are some initials from the saddle blanket, he said. You see, we're trying to restore the Baron's son Bernard to his true form. Amelia glasped, gasped her hands together, her look of sorrow slowly melting. I knew he was alive somewhere, she said vehemently. I felt sure with all the search parties that they would have found his body. We believe he was turned into a bear, the bear I told you about, exclaimed Falcon as he pulled out the last of the ingredients. That's the bear's hair in this bag. She opened each of the jars and looked inside, then made a gesture over the items and smiled. Oh, these should do nicely, she said. This will be my first time making a dispel potion, but the process is similar to other potions. It should just take a short while. Why don't you get comfortable? Falcon thought there was little chance of him feeling comfortable, but he dutifully sat down and watched Amelia at work. She was not a beautiful woman, but there was something pleasing about the way she moved and went about her duties, so rhythmic and self-assured. Falcon wondered if he would ever feel as much a home anywhere as she seemed to be in this little cottage. Amelia pulled down a heavy leather-bound book she had consulted earlier and reread the recipe. Next, she took out a large mortar and pestle and ground the dry ingredients into a powder. The magical water coruscated as she trickled it into a metal pot. So, Barnard was turned into a bear, Amelia commented absently as she worked. That's rather appropriate somehow. He, he was, is, a, a tall boy with very strong bones and, and quite a growl on him, dark like his father, and quite handsome. We hope to restore him today, said Falcon. That way, my brother can finally meet the Sigborg's ruling family and, and gain a secure place here. Well, the Baron will certainly be overjoyed to have his boy back, said Amelia. They say he never stopped believing he was alive. She hung the pot from a long hook in the ceiling and filled it part way with clear water from a crystal bottle. Next, she brought the burning skull over to, and held it close to the pot. Sensing the movement, the skull's eyes ignited, sending a blast of flame into the bottom of the pot. You're a very good brother and a sensitive person, 
said Amelia as she repeatedly flamed the pot, bringing the mixture to a boil. It's rare to find someone as good-looking with you, as you with so much heart. Most handsome young men tend to be arrogant and self-centered. Falcon felt himself pinking, turning pink again. Um, about last time, he said, I'm sorry I acted so stupid and, and ran off like that. I, I just didn't expect you to, to, you know, kiss you. Amelia looked up at him and smiled roguishly. That's all right, she said. Perhaps next time you won't be so surprised. Falcon opened his mouth, but all that came out was a feeble squeak. Wren did her best to sneak soundlessly along the banks of the stream as she made her way back from Marana's piece. After the bear incident, Al had escorted her there to ensure her a safe journey back to town while he went to Zauberberg. There were a lot of things in the forest to make noise when she stepped on them, Wren discovered. She would have to have some serious practice before she could move around unheard. As Wren passed a large blueberry bush, there came a sharp yip from behind it that made her jump. Her friend the fox stepped out from concealment and sat down with that wicked grin on his face. Wren smiled back, to it, back at him. You really are good at hiding, Fox, she said affectionately. You should teach me that sometime. Sox, said the fox, then gave a little snort that sounded like laughter. I've been thinking about you, she said. I found out who you were talking about. Baba Yaga, right? The fox nodded, watching her attentively. And you won't believe what I found out. I found a way to turn you back into a man. The fox flattened his ears and looked at her, seeming less than delighted. Oh, don't worry. It doesn't involve Baba Yaga. All we have to do is make a potion for you. The fox gently nosed her hand. No man, he said quietly. Socks. Uh, but you could be a man again, said Wren, somewhat more uncertainly. We're going to turn the Baron's son back into a man. He's been a bear for years. He almost ate me this morning. Socks just shook his head again. No man. Yike, Socks. You like being a fox? asked Red in disbelief. Don't you want to talk to your father and walk around on two legs again and eat apple strudel instead of Roth chickens? The fox slumped to the ground. Papa, he said sadly. Wren sat on the ground beside Socks and scratched him behind one ear. He closed his eyes happily. Maybe we could talk to your father, both of us, she said after a while. He really likes foxes, so maybe he'd listen to you the way you are. Then, if you like, we can turn you back into a man again. Fox still looked downcast. Papa, yike socks. Papa, no yike man. It took a moment for Wren to realize what socks meant. When she did, she stared at him aghast. But he's your papa, she exclaimed. He's kind of like you. Socks shook his head in disagreement. He stood up and started to snarl, hiss, and attack an invisible opponent. Then he turned back to Wren with what was almost a shrug. Wren sighed. Is that what your father was like, fighting with you all the time? Well, I guess I wouldn't know what fo fathers are like. She sat for a moment, feeling a bit melancholy. Socks crept over to her and nudged her hand, as though sorry for making her feel bad. He licked her fingers, and she giggled. Don't you want to be a man again? She said, scratching his ears again. You don't have to fight with your father. You can go off and start your own thieves' guild, and I'll be your first member. Again, Socks shook his head. Socks, Papa, na, he said. Me, yeti Socks, we Soxes. Wren worked through the translation in her head. 
You're a papa? She asked in amazement. Really? Socks nodded proudly. These socks is best. Yuck, I show you. The fox started to dash off, then looked back at Wren over his shoulder, the way he did when he wanted Wren to follow him at the brigand's camp. Okay, show me, Wren said as she got back up on her feet and gave chase. The fox led Wren some distance into the woods to the farmlands. She followed him back to where Heinrich's trap had been set, and then along a faint trail back into the woods. Wren watched with admiration the way Sox slipped silently through the brush and dried grass. She did his, her best to imitate his movements, and it helped a little. Finally, Sox ran up to a fallen log that had been a hollow opening on one side. He jumped up into the log and started to dance with excitement. Yuck, he said merrily. Wren approached the log with a smile. I'm yucking, I'm yucking. Inside the hollow log, which was lined with grass and loose fur, Wren could see a honey-colored fox curled up with a pair of cubs nursing at her side. One looked just like a sox. The other was honey gold like its mother. The vixen snarled and, and started to rise at the sight of Wren, but Sox jumped down inside the log and ran over to her. He licked her face to calm her down. Oh, they look like kittens, Wren said with delight, keeping a respectful distance. See, yady Sox, said Sox proudly as he nestled the vixen. I yady. The vixen just glared suspiciously at Wren. It was strange how, even from the vixen's movements and the look in her eyes, Wren could see how different she was from Sox, how feral. She was clearly confused and unsettled by her mate's odd behavior. It's okay, Wren said soothingly to the vixen. I, I won't get too near. Yike, said Fox merrily. Twins, said Wren happily. A boy and a girl? Sox nodded, and he walked back out of the den. See, he said quietly. No, man. Papa Sox now. Wren nodded a bit sadly. I guess they do kind of need a papa and a mama, she said with a sigh. Okay, I'll just let you be a fox if that's what you want. We could still be friends, right? And if I ever see your papa again, I'll, I'll talk to him for you. Sox danced happily in front of her. Thank you. Fox, go now, go hunt. Sure, said Wren as she backed away from the den. I'd better get back to town before my brothers do, or they'll be mad at me. See you later. She waved, looking back at the den. Bye, baby foxes and mama fox. The vixen just stared nervously at Wren, but Sox lifted one black paw in a merry wave before running off into the woods. That was chapter 21. And that was the end of this book. And that is the 